Man, this stuff is good. Oh, hey. Uh, what's going on, guys? So, we are going to be talking and fielding some questions on rifle builds, which is honestly probably some of the most questions that we get through our customer service inbox is about rifles. It's not even so much about pistols and holsters, although obviously we get those, but it's people asking about rifles. And uh, there's a couple things I want to go over real quick. People will constantly ask questions like, hey, what optic do I get? What muzzle device? What trigger? Whatever, blah, 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 blah. But it's important to understand that when you go to ask these questions, you really need to have an underlying principle that is uh, guiding some of your purchasing decisions and kind of what you're looking for. So a lot of it just comes down to uh, mission is going to dictate your gear. So for example, if you are a hog hunter, there are certain things you are going to want more than if you are someone going out and shooting elk from 800 meters away, uh, out west, out in the mountains somewhere. If you're someone who's only planning for a classic home defense scenario where you may have one or three adversaries running into your house, breaking through your front and back door simultaneously, you may need a different kind of gun for that. Or if you're someone who wants to be prepared for very uncertain times, uh, such as these that we are going through right now, you may need something completely different. And this is one reason why at T-Rex Arms, we put a lot of purpose into talking about equipment because just having firearms and preparedness isn't just about having, you know, concealed carrying a pistol. It's not just about having one rifle, but it's about completing everything and having, you know, good logistics, communication, uh, having a network of individuals, having equipment so you can carry ammunition and medical, radios, communications. Uh, my brother Isaac has produced some really good content about that because there's so much more to the puzzle than just firearms. But for this live, we're going to be uh, focusing specifically on rifles uh, because pistols wound people, rifles actually kill people, actually stop people, and are obviously much more effective. So I personally love how much people ask questions about rifles. Got a little camera over here, something a little different. But... Uh, because so many people for the longest time were focusing so much on concealed carry and handguns. But the reality is if I'm going to choose one of two weapons, I am definitely going to choose a rifle. I'm not going to rely on a handgun if a rifle can be readily available. Uh, handguns generally suck for shooting people. The ballistics are horrible. You want something that is obviously a rifle cartridge if you actually want to make a difference and do things. So let's talk about some of the core I guess you could say fundamentals to how we build our rifles. So obviously the first thing is I'm going to determine a barrel length. Uh, this is going to determine kind of the application of the weapon. Uh, caliber really comes first, but the majority of my guns are 5.56. So they're an intermediate cartridge I can carry a lot of that is still effective. Yes, 5.56 actually is very effective. I know a lot of people out there are like, no, it's done, 30 caliber is king. And 30 caliber is awesome, whether it's 308 or other calibers out there, but the reality is if I'm carrying six magazines and I want low recoil so I can shoot really fast, get my uh, rounds on target much more efficiently, that's where 5.56 really uh, comes into play. So I choose, obviously, already got my caliber, 5.56. I then choose my barrel length. What is the weapon for? Uh, the reality is most of the guns I'm running around with right now are short barreled because the majority of scenarios that I want to be prepared for uh, generally are going to occur within talking distance. If we look at some of the events that are unfolding right now in America, uh, you can look at those and see that if you are in one of those situations and need to go to a gun, most of those are happening within about 15 meters. So do I need a 16 inch gun? Do I need a DMR? Do I need a 6.5 Creedmoor? Do I need a 308? The answer is probably not. I would actually be better off with a shorter gun that's faster to run around with, move around with, ADS with, all that good stuff. And yes, I do use video game references because I worked on Call of Duty, but we won't get into that. But so what I like to do is a lot of my guns are generally of the shorter barrel variety. Uh, this makes them a little bit lighter for running around with, a little bit faster to maneuver on the range. Uh, this is also very beneficial when I start adding suppressors. Uh, this is a full-size RC2 Surefire can, which is about 7 inches long and adds some weight. So if I add this can to this 10-3 gun like so, I now have an overall length of, say, uh, I end up having like a 16-inch barrel, 16-inch upper, something like that. So if I go to take this suppressor, for example, and I add it to this 14-5, this uh, Block 2, now I'm looking at having a 21-inch gun, something like that. Now, obviously, you can still run this gun pretty fast. I like to dem demo that in our videos, but the reality is this is going to be a little more unwieldy up close in a vehicle, uh, deploying from a bag, hiding in a bag, uh, just putting in my car. It's a lot less convenient than a shorter weapon. And one of my favorite uh, guns to kind of mess around with as far as getting a little shorter, a little more compact, maneuverable, are weapons in the 300 Blackout variety. So this is a new weapon that I built recently. 
well, had built. Steve actually assembled a lot of it. Uh, this is an 8-inch 300 blackout upper. It's a Seekins barrel, Geisley rail. Uh, as you can see, the rail is very close to the suppressor itself. I'm testing the uh, Dead Air Sandman K, uh, which has been working really great. But this gun with a law folder stock, as you guys can see, can actually get pretty small and compact. And I can fit this into my standard clothes duffel bag and then have a carbine and not have to rely on my handgun. So that's just a couple things to think about when you're building out your gun or figuring out what to buy is, what's the weapon for? Is it for hunting? Is it for home defense? Is it for civil unrest? Is it for being on a rooftop? Is it for something far worse? Uh, I've talked to a couple buddies who said, hey, I'm not gonna go shorter than a 14.5 because I need the ballistics, I need the range. But then they admit, well, if I'm doing car operations or I'm doing stuff in buildings or I'm in close proximity to people, a shorter barrel has its uses and is very effective. So what I generally tell people is, you know, get something in the middle like a 14.5 and then later on get that small gun, that short gun, that 300 blackout, that little gun in case you have to put it in a bag, transport it, move around and do stuff. Now, then people ask, well, they, you know, they establish, they figure out like their barrel length and their uppers and all that stuff. They go, what is the first upgrade that I add to the gun? Because most people in their brain are thinking they can buy skill through buying fancy equipment like triggers. Uh, the reality is, no, you don't do that. You can't do that. Don't do that. It doesn't work that way. But the first upgrade you should get is going to be a weapon light. Uh, the reason for this is you can only shoot what you can identify. Most bad things happen at night, especially if you look at the events unfolding right now. Uh, the protests have generally gotten the most violent at night where things start to get all weird. Uh, so you want to have a weapon light so you can really see what's going on. So my preference for weapon light and our preference here at T-Rex Arms are Surefires and Mod Lights. So I've got a Surefire on this gun, M600 Scout. And I've got a mod light, uh, I want to say it's a PLH or an OKW, but more or less they're the same. They just have a different throw, a different illumination more or less. And then there's a variety of different mounts I can use to set these up on uh, their perspective guns. There's Picatinny mounts, there's M-Lock mounts. Honestly, I'm not going to talk much about that. You guys can figure that out. But first upgrade is going to be a light. So I can see what's going on. I can still shoot with iron sights even if I have a weapon light. The next upgrade is definitely an optic, or well, a sling. People are like, well, why didn't you mention sling? Well, I just assume everyone has a sling because they're dirt cheap and you can get them and it's no problem. And our sling, just hide that from you guys, will be available soon. Um, but well, the second upgrade I would say is an optic. Iron sights are obviously not the fastest, they're not the most efficient. It is kind of funny though, because back when red dots were being toyed with, everyone's like, red dots are dumb, iron sights are the way to go. And it's like, well, actually now, that debate's been put to bed, and basically every gun gets issued with some form of, uh, you know, optical device, some sort of illuminated you know, aim point, M68, ACOG, something that is not iron sights. Iron sights are important to know how to use. You definitely need to know how to use them. You need to train with them. Um, I don't recommend you just go straight to a red dot, or if you do, transition, train with both. That's one reason. I actually have this gun set up, uh, this one, oh, here it is, the way that it is. So I have Scalarworks irons mounted here, uh, in this position and people were like, oh, why are you running a rear sight in front of the front one? Well, the reason for that is it's actually much faster Or at least what I was finding to align the sights when the rear aperture is actually further out and closer to the front sight Obviously when you have your sights closer together, it is a little bit faster But ultimately the reason for this is um, there's less room for error as I'm hunting through the uh, rear aperture and the front sight post itself when you start pushing it closer together, when you bring it up, there's, you're, it's just, it's gonna be there. Uh, that's what I was finding. So this is something, and this kind of brings me back to another thing. I'm sure there's a lot of questions going on. I am gonna get to those here in a second. I'm just gonna cover some things, then we'll start hammering questions and showing you guys some guns for, here from the armory. But people are like, why do you do this? What is the benefit? And I'm like, nothing is stopping you from going out and figuring this out yourself. If you have a rifle and you have a set of iron sights, which by the way, most rifles come with and are super cheap, there's nothing stopping you from removing your optic, shoving that rear side up, or bringing this one back, or doing something and going to the range and trying it. The worst that's going to happen is you're going to realize it was bad, you're going to think, oh, I wasted money on ammo, but the reality is no, you got reps. And then the worst that's going to happen is you're going to have to re-zero your optic when you put it on, or re-zero re your irons, whatever it is. But there's no reason to just rely on people on the internet for all the feedback Unless it's something so expensive you don't own, you want that feedback before you go out and buy it so that you don't lose money. But if it's something like this, you can figure this out on your own. But I'd say give it a shot, see if you like it. So with my rear sight uh, adjusted the way that it is, when I went to put my EOTech on because I was shooting some, doing some auto stuff, uh, I just slapped it on. Uh, the zero was pretty good. It wasn't uh, absolutely perfect, but um, you know, it looks a little funky. 
and that's because it is. So, but uh, iron sights, obviously important to know how to use those, but then you should definitely get an optic of some sort. Neotech Aimpoint, uh, magnified optic. Magnifiers definitely have their place. I've got uh, my 416 over here. I have the new Tango 6T. Um, this one has the M855A1 reticle, so this is a second focal plane. The brightness is a lot better, and you can run with one of these, uh, and they're pretty cool. I will say, though, I know people love to talk about 1-6s to sixes and are like, oh, they're, you know, they're just as good as red dots, plus they give you magnification. And the reality is, they're not. They're not as good on one power. A lot of them aren't bright enough. You've got, uh, obviously, your length of pull and your eye shadow and your... Uh, Oh, shoot. What's it called? Your length of, uh, shoot. What's it called? Whatever. The distance you have to be to the uh, optic. I can't remember with your eye box. Sometimes eye I forget. Thank you. Eye relief. Thank eye you, box. Charles. Eye box, eye relief, ADS speed, all that good stuff. No. Uh, so you have another issue there. So a lot of people, when you're shooting on a standard range and you're just doing this action right here, I have perfect eye relief with my optic because I've set my sock up appropriately. I've shoved my scope all the way forward. Looks great. But as soon as you start shooting on the move, shooting moving targets, shooting from weird positions, even if I'm on one power where my eye relief is more generous, it's very easy to lose that reticle entirely and not be able to engage. But if I'm running a Neotech or I'm running an Aimpoint, I can actually put that dot, that, that your reticle, anywhere inside of that glass and I can still make hits. So in my opinion, red dots such as the Eotech, the Aimpoint, and other ones out there are always going to have their place. They're always going to have some superiority over scopes because scopes are more finicky and generally speaking they're a little more fragile as well so let's real fast hit a few questions because i have a wide variety of guns here and i sometimes just don't know i really thank you yes f's in the chat just kidding don't so uh daniel the fence their guns are pretty good although um you can build a gun for a lot cheaper uh, none of these guns are actually daniel guns they just have daniel rails on them uh, a lot of folks ask about their guns their guns are fine uh you're just going to pay for them that's for sure um, do you prefer lower third, uh, th lower third co-witness or a higher amount of one and three? So I've obviously got one nine threes here. So the EOTech, this is the EOTech EXPS three is a lower third. Now, obviously a lower third is just fine. Actually, we'll use this camera. As far as getting on the optic, I'm good to go. I do see my iron sights in the bottom of the uh, optic itself and the PEC-15, but as you can see, my stock placement, my head placement, still good to go to find the center of the window and the optic. If I take this guy, which is a 193. It makes the process a little easier, but my head is more or less in the same position. And the downside to 193s, people have to be like, oh, gas masks and night vision. Yes, it helps there. It just helps all the time as well. The downside to 193 is now I don't have irons that are going to co-witness with this optic because, well, nobody makes them yet, at least that I know of. So that's one reason why I have offset irons on here. So if for whatever reason my aim point didn't work, I could run to my offsets and run those. Is it weird? Yes, it is. Should you do it? you might want to consider it. So I like 193s a lot, but honestly, I swap between both. And the really funny thing is, even with a Neotech, a standard lower third, you got bino nods, you can still get behind it fine. So people are like, oh, no, I need a tall mount. I'm like, no, you can actually do it with a normal one. It's just, it sucks a little more. Um, Liku, yes, we'd like to have Liku um, back out, but thanks to COVID and like all the stuff going on and people eating bats, like it's not going to happen. Um, it's not, probably not this year. Next year, absolutely. The plan is to bring him back and do some cool stuff. So, uh, Dental Fence, yes. Lightweight rifle builds. Yeah, so lightweight rifle builds definitely have their place, uh, like polymer lowers, um, super lightweight barrels, pencil barrels, uh, but they also have their drawbacks as far as, um, you know, lasting a long time, uh, taking certain kinds of abuse. Honestly, a carbine like this, even though this has a quad rail, um, is just fine. Like, it's really not a problem. I'm a skinny guy. I've got a small frame, and people are like, oh, he probably can't do anything. And I'm like, well, I can run a gun with a saw, which is like 20-something pounds. Uh, so taking one of these guns, like this 10-3, with a laser on it, a light, an optic, a suppressor, all that good stuff. I can add that suppressor. Um, it's not a real big deal. Lightweight rifles have their place, but I would say focus more on you know, the reliability and the durability and the longevity of that weapon before you focus so much on like saving ounces here and there. There's definitely a time and a place for that. I prefer a lighter gun over a heavier gun, but I think some people pursue the lightweight aspect so much and then they don't go out and shoot the gun and the gun may, the barrel may wear out way faster than a heavier barrel bend because you can't put a suppressor on it because it didn't have the structure in the barrel to actually hold the suppressor because it's a little pencil barrel and it's like, ew. So don't want any of that. So um, I like guns with like 
medium weight barrels and not necessarily, you know, pencil barrels. My old BCM 10.3 or 13.7 is a pencil. Super light, but uh, I don't do those anymore. Why you take all the way back? Uh, I already explained that with the iron sights. For a grip on a pistol, honestly, I'm not going to talk about that because nobody knows the stuff with that. And don't email the ATF. Never do that. That doesn't do us, do us any good. Uh, you could just uh, research that on your own time. Uh, but these are all SBRs. Oh, my dad. I'm not sponsored by Rain, no. But I'm not. <laughs> Holy, speaking of that. Okay, it's really, it's really hitting me hard as long as I say talking, talking, talking. Guys, the M-Lock rails. Yeah, guys, the rails are super good. I have those on a bunch of guns here on my 10-3 right here on this new 300 Blackout on this 416. Um, this MCX, this has a, uh, the uh, SIG SD rail. Daniel rail, Daniel rail, Daniel rail. Uh, AK, you know, but you guys are like, oh, talk about that. No, we won't. Yeah, we might hear in a little bit. Yeah, we might hear in a little bit. I also have another one over there. I've got the crank. Crank's pretty cool. MCX Virtus. So the MCX, I think the MCX is one of the coolest guns uh, that is out right now that you can purchase out of the box. Uh, as far as the accessories and how much they've uh, built into the gun allow you to do, there have been a lot of guns that have come out in the past, like the ACR. Um, there have been a few others where they marketed like super versatile, super modular, but then they didn't release it with the modular parts. So the benefit of that system didn't really work. Um, but what I've liked about the MCX, they did quickly go from Gen 1 to Gen 2. That kind of sucked because they have Gen 1s. They don't take parts from the same one. Um, but the Virtus does have rails that they sell factory that can go over a suppressor. I can take this, this rail off and go to a standard one. I can add an even longer SD rail. I can add a shorter one. Um, they, go, they make like all the different uh, variations out there for you to purchase straight on their website or from a distributor. They have a lot of different stock options. Uh, there's companies like Parker Mountain that make extended uh, bolt releases. Uh, they can take standard AR triggers in some cases. Um, but the MCX, what I like about it, obviously it's a piston driven gun so I can shoot it without the stock. So if I want to go no stock for extra movement speed and extra ADS speed, then this is how I'm going to run it. But uh, what I like about that is I can throw this in a bag. It's a little more compact back here than it would be a law folder, which adds about an inch. So I can fit this into more bags and do more stuff with it and shoot from here if I have to. Uh, so that's something I really like. These little folding metal stocks do have their problems though. Uh, I like having more surface area in my shoulder when I'm actually shooting and putting my, getting a chin weld on one of these little skinny stocks is not always as good. And so they do have their downsides, but overall, I definitely uh, like something like this. So, but then you can debate piston versus direct impingement for suppressors and cleanliness and all that stuff. And uh, I, I like my direct impingement guns. In fact, in some ways I like them more than my piston guns. They recoil super nice in comparison. Um, although the MCX is fine. Like this is a little direct impingement 300 blackout and this thing runs just fine. It runs super, super well. More questions. Let's see. Never ask the ATF anything. Yes, Isaac is correct. That is the way. Um, no, I have no word on the pistol brace news at all. Yeah, get that out of there. They can't see that. Uh, <laughs> we had to sterilize when we came in here. I ran here real quick. I got here uh, right essentially when we started. And I was like, anything in here that they can't see? Any like parts? So we have to do that every time because we got... A lot of products coming down, including rifle parts. I actually do have our Picatinny light bar. You can show that. That's fine. Um, this is a, a prototype of it. Uncoated, unanodized Picatinny light bar. This will jam this sucker all the way through. And over on this gun, as you can see, this uh, EBR, um, it pushes it way out here, which is super nice. Although this gun is not optimal uh, for that product. But uh, you can put it on basically everything. A crank, a saw. Actually, on the saw, it's super awesome. Really like that. 11.5 is the best length. So honestly, there's a lot of debate. Let's talk about that real quick. There's a lot of debate. 10.3, 10.5, 11.5, 12.5, 13.7, 14.5, 16, 18, 20. Yeah, the rain's hitting me hard. The deal with all those barrel lengths are, honestly, they're all gonna work if you're shooting inside of 50, 100 meters. Once you start getting beyond that, that's where it's like, okay, I need the velocity of my 14.5 to shoot reliably to three, 400 and have good ballistics and good terminal velocity and good just results on flesh and bone. But the reality is most people asking these questions don't even have the skills to be able to make that barrel length work at those distances or even have the skills necessary to make any gun work at close range. 
So what I think the debate needs to be is less on the particulars, which is why I kind of hate doing these kinds of lives, talking about just like gun parts, because it all comes back to training. Like whether I take this 10.3 or this 10.3 or this nine inch or this 14.5 or that EBR or the, those are all short as well back there. It doesn't matter which one I take. If I can't hit stuff, if I can't move quickly, if I can't shoot quickly, it's not gonna matter. So as far as barrel length goes, whether you pick a 10.3 out to a 16, in my opinion, it doesn't matter for the majority of scenarios that most Americans are gonna find themselves in today, which is within talking distance. I'm not gonna be shooting people from 500 meters. I'm, you know, I buy these guns not for hunting animals. I buy these guns to protect people and myself. So I have to look at realistic scenarios in which that could happen. And the majority of those would be within talking distance. That's the only range I'm going to be able to positively identify someone as a threat and has the means and the intent to hurt me or someone else. So going with that, it's probably within 50 meters. And so at that point, it doesn't really matter if I have a 10, three, an 11, a 12, a 13, a 14, a 15, a 16, a seven, an 18, whatever, it doesn't really matter. But I need something that's fast, I need something that's reliable, and I need something that I can actually, well, I need the skills, so I have to have that myself. I also need to have my bomb energy drink, not sponsored, so that I can get the job done. But it all comes back to training. So the majority of the question is probably getting asked in here. The answer is get good, spelled G-I-T-G-U-D. Get good is the answer. I like, I like all of them, 10.3, 11 and a half, 12 and a half, they're great. Just know, as your barrel starts to get longer and you start to add these suckers to them, you're obviously increasing weight, um, which is one reason why I really like running these Surefire Minis on my uh, longer guns, my 13.7s and my 14.5s. It keeps them a little more maneuverable. I still get some noise reduction, flash reduction, all that good stuff. Questions, let's see. PCC, all right, PCCs. Do I? Oh wait, I do it. Follow me, I do have something. Now, you guys are getting a sneak peek to this. Since we're talking about PCCs, now, oh shoot, this isn't, I'm missing the stock. This is a prototype, don't show it. So this, this is the future. since we are going to talk about, holy mo, it's turning on. Since we're gonna talk about PCCs, I'll get right here. They have their place for sure. They especially have their place when you have a 20 lumen flashlight that goes on top. See that action? See how sick this is? We'll make a video with this. This is a, one of the latest items that I acquired recently. Yes, this is the uh, light combo that was used in the Iranian siege. Um, so you guys may have seen the film six six days, six hours, six days. Uh, they didn't actually have these in the film, but this thing is literally like 20 lumens. But this is a PCC. It's an MP5. It does not have a stock on it because uh, I was pulling parts to go on another gun. Uh, PCCs definitely have their place, um, but the problem with PCCs, this is actually a good example of the competition community driving a piece of hardware that doesn't have as much practical practicality when it comes to shooting people or home defense or the real world. So the issue is I'm shooting a pistol caliber out of maybe a longer barrel, but we know that pistol calibers suck for stopping people. Now in competition, it doesn't matter. You're just trying to get a gun that shoots fast, low recoil, you can run a gun with, and that's great. But the problem is the PCC world has created uh, you know, guns such as um, 16 inch MPXs and it's like there's no practical area in which I would choose a gun this big, a 16 inch 9 mil gun, when at that point I could just pick a 14.5556 and be shooting a rifle caliber. The funny thing with uh, like AR 9 mils is they actually typically recoil more than a rifle caliber gun just due to how the recoil system works. They always are more like they stutter more and they jump more and they're more snappy than a standard 5.56 rifle. That's a AR 9. Yeah, so, and that's where like the MPX can be a little better. The MP5 can be really good. Those recoil super soft. But at the end of the day, the whole PCC like genre was spawned from competition. It was not spawned from practicality of shooting people. Um, the Where PDWs or where PCCs make sense and, and for that is a tiny gun that can get smaller than this guy right here that shoots a rifle caliber. So I don't recommend PCCs really for anything except for fun or competition. Uh, at that point, if I'm doing a full gun, a big gun, I'm gonna shoot a rifle caliber. I'm gonna shoot something that actually is effective at stopping people and not just for shooting a match. So, no, that's funny to say because I'm a civilian and I shoot competitions once a year, but the facts remain. So, Glock or 2011, uh, Glock. 2011s are cool, they have their place, but uh, man, they're, they can be really finicky too. 
Thank you. This is a good example of where a PDW, a PCC, actually starts to make sense. It is way smaller than any of my normal rifle caliber guns. Now this is still kind of dumb, to be honest. It's also stupidly expensive. I don't recommend you buy one of these. But this is the only time where like a PCC type gun actually starts to make sense. It is a pistol caliber still, but I can put this into almost any bag. So that's kind of cool. This is a TP9 with a suppressor. I've got a white light. I actually have my 300 blackout Wilcox Boss on here. Um, this is actually made for 300 blackout. You can zero subsonic and supersonic. It actually says on here. So right now it's on subs. I twist it around. Now I'm on supers. It also has an integrated IR laser and viz laser and illuminator. Uh, super cool, pretty hard to get, and uh, but the dot's super dim, so it really only works in England. Um, it's not gonna work here, that's for sure. So, but it's pretty cool. I put that on that gun, so. Uh, -da -da. You are welcome. Solid shaping. Yeah, these energy drinks are, they're good. Uh, Sig optics are good. Uh, yeah, I haven't got any of the Romeos yet. I'd like to get a few of those and try them out. Uh, I've only had their scopes. I haven't tried anything else from them. Um, I know some dudes that are running them, uh, some guys in a, in a certain unit who've been using them, and they seem to like them just fine. So um, can you put a 5900 flashlight on there? Oh, on that light, convert it? Probably not. I'm going to look into it, though. It'll be cool. Um, uh, let's see. I'm scanning, scanning, more scanning. Uh, John Wick 3, where he's PCC, that's why. That's true. People are wanting that. And here's the thing. Movies can be really good at getting people interested in guns. They can be really good at educating people in certain ways. Uh, but when you have a film like that where they're like, these are special 9 mil bullets that will, like, destroy dudes. It's like, no, that's kind of dumb. PCC, it's super awesome. I'm like, no, you just needed a different gun from the first film so that it's different. But in the first film, we had a 416, which is already pretty awesome and shoots 556 five, so they had to do something else so in john wick 4 he'll probably be running around with like a a 22 they'll probably be like 22 super silent like you won't even hear it and literally he'll go to shoot and be like nothing that'll probably be the gun in john wick 4 i'm predicting it right now but his nine millimeter guns were already silent yeah they were pretty quiet so the 22 will be nothing you'll just hear like the trigger which is actually that's fairly accurate 22s can be super quiet which is awesome um, cloud defensive owl. So I have, oh yeah, I have one right here. So this light, I'm going to be brutally honest. I like some of the cloud defensive products out there. This one I would only like if it was about 200 bucks. The reason I say that is it's priced at like three something. And at that price I can get a surefire or I can get a mod light. Um, plus those are more modular. I can use them with more stuff. This light I'm really restricted in only using it one way. I can only mount it top side pretty much. It is very user friendly. Uh, it's idiot proof. It's mounted on the top. It has a big button, rechargeable battery, and I'm good to go. But outside of that, I can't use it with a laser. Uh, I can't put it on certain guns. Uh, I can't put it on like an MP5 because uh, obviously that's got some stuff in the way. So this light is very limited is for what it is, and that's one reason I don't like it, but it's also priced at the same price point as a Surefire, so it just doesn't make sense. Um, I, would, I would recommend getting one of those other ones. If this was like $200, I'd be like, absolutely, you know, issue it out to a department of guys who, you know, don't do a lot of stuff with gear, uh, maybe even a military unit, uh, maybe even, you know, if I was building out a gun for a friend of mine who isn't a shooter, isn't really super serious, I might throw this on there and be like, button, press, light, it will, it will turn on. Like that's, that's pretty good idiot proof. That's where I would use it. If for someone who doesn't know a lot, but otherwise I'd say buy a mod light, buy a surefire. And, uh, I'm a little, I was a little disappointed in the owl just due to the price point, but that's because it's made in America and a bunch of stuff like that. So Draco AK pistols, dumb ish, dumb. Um, obviously there's certain folks think they're the coolest thing ever, but no, they're not that effective. Um, I'm not a huge fan of AKs for a lot of reasons. PCC stands for pistol caliber, car pistol caliber carbine. All right, I'll be good to go. And give it like five minutes. Um, how does Sam NK hold up against the 300 SPS uh, for 300 blackout? I'm not sure. Um, it's obviously it's lighter, so I can move the gun around faster. I need to shoot without ear pro and see what the difference is. But with ear pro on, they sound similar, obviously. Um, but I'll need to just test it with my ears off and find out. Gamer tag in Botkin, of course. Uh, what bullet carrier group would you recommend? Um, I've got a uh, Toolcraft and a bunch of these. Uh, honestly, there's 
bolt carriers. There's a lot of good ones out there. Uh, there's a bunch of weird coatings they do, like tin coatings, bronze coatings, gold coatings, silver coatings, tungsten. There's a bunch of weird coatings, and they're like easier to clean. And it's like, well, if you're constantly cleaning your gun all the time, I guess that makes sense. But no, all these like normal standard bolts have worked fine, and I never clean my guns. Well, I do when they really start to choke. Uh, just need to lube them often, and you're good to go. Uh, Vortex Optics. Vortex Optics are really good. It's probably one of the best 1 to 6s out there. This is the Razer 1 to 6 HD uh, Gen 2. And uh, it's one of the best, in my opinion, due to durability, due to the reticle, due to the brightness. That's a big part of having a scope if you're actually trying to shoot it on uh, 1 power, um, you know, in bright sunlight. A lot of LPVOs out there, it's super disappointing. I have a bunch over here. Um, let's... I'll just gather them up. I've got all, I've got all kinds of, of these. This one, or this one. Oh, that's a, is a, that's a two to ten. But the problem with these is they get marketed as, you know, you go to the conventions, you read the press releases, and they're like daylight bright, good to go. And then you look through it on a sunny day in like normal conditions, and you can't see the reticle. Um, that's just the reality of these. Like this Schmidt and Bender Short Dot CC. Awesome scope. Well, supposedly. Um, super expensive. It's a Schmidt, right? One power. The etch radical is impossible to see in bright sunlight. So if your battery dies, you're looking through a glass tube. And with illumination, it's also super dim. So this does not give you any of the benefits that 1 to 6s, 1 to 8s, you know, supposedly give you being awesome on one power. And that's just the reality of some of these scopes due to the technology that we have right now uh, that gets dealt with. And this is a $3,000 whatever scope. I think it's more like 3800 And I've literally used this for like two range days, and it's been sitting there for a year, something like that. Because it kind of sucked, to be honest. Uh, Night Force 2 to 10 is obviously a little more longer range. Um, I haven't used this in a while, uh, but it definitely, it, they don't advertise the capability of being used like a red dot. So... We're gonna get rid of that sucker. Uh, the this is the really fancy uh, not Lou Lou uh, 1.1 to 8. Uh, this is a 1.1. I've tried to shoot on one power. It's just not as good um, as his true one power scope. Uh, this one's the one that's made for the scar because scars can like rip optics apart. So that's why I was uh, running this. Had a throw lever from uh, I think this is a, a vortex, and I just added tape to get it to fit. Way better than going out and spending $50 on the actual throw lever. So, you know, you save money so you can have money so you can buy nice things, right? Uh, this is the Attacker 1-8. to uh, This is one that got SOCOM approved, uh, I think, last year. This one's not bad on one power. It's pretty bright. Um, so basically, what you have with these scopes is you either make the reticle, if it's a first focal plane. Second focal plane means that the reticle never changes. As you zoom in, it's just you zoom in and the reticle stays the same at whatever distance. Um, the, the problem with the first focal plane, that's where the reticle actually like zooms in as you zoom, is you either have to focus on the 1x being really good because the reticle's nice and dark and big and you can like actually run it when your battery's dead and shoot. But then once you zoom into 8 power or 6 power, obviously the reticle starts to get bigger and now you have a ton of data in the way, a ton of numbers, windage, Christmas tree, like all this crap going on. And that's kind of what's going on with this guy. On one power, there's some good etched reticle that allows you to shoot if the battery's dead because most of these have super, uh, the batteries don't last very long. But, and then as soon as you get to eight power, it's like, oh my goodness, that's a lot of stuff I have to deal with. Um, so that's one reason I don't like this. But with these first focal plane scopes, it's either you prioritize the eight power or the six power, maximum power, or the first power of actually shooting up close, running it and stuff like that. So for me, when I vet an LPBO, like a scope like one of these, I really vet it, I vet it more on one power than I do on magnification. And that's just because I'm more likely to be using it on one power within 50 meters than actually dialing up and then taking shots to 500. So again, this trend right here of like put the dudes putting these on their guns, it all comes back to, is it something you actually need? Is it something you're actually going to use? Is it something you know how to use? And that's why I recommend most people just go get a red dot. Like most of their engagements are probably within 50 meters anyway. Uh, they're not going to need all the benefits out of this guy. The main benefit from this is target identification where I can zoom in, I can look around, I can see what's going on, and then I can go back to one power uh, when I start doing stuff or I just go back to waiting around. So LPVO is super cool, but there's some stuff that people aren't talking enough about regarding them. So don't just follow the trends. I know it's weird for me to say that, but, uh, you know. All right. American Defense. They make some good stuff. I've had some of their mounts fail, though. Dead air suppressors. They're pretty good. I'd like to get more. Uh, have you tried the new 1 to 10? Yes, I have tried the 1 to 10. It is uh, um, another scope that I don't like very much. Uh, 
Mm. I put it on a gun, I think, or something. All right, well, guys, I lost it. So the 1 to 10, the new Razer 1 to 10, is not the new version of this. They're still selling this guy. But the problem with that one is on one power, you can barely see it because they obviously prioritized the 10 power engaging a distance. Um, the illumination is really bad. So I was shooting it on, uh, on one power, trying to do my target transitions and stuff, and I barely could see it. It was very similar to the Schmidt scope. Uh, so again, I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of the 1 to 10. The eye relief was super finicky. The eye box was super finicky. Uh, it's also about $2,600, $2,300, something like that. So um, I still prefer this guy right here. Obviously, it's only a six power, but honestly, six power is probably all most people are going to need versus having like a 10 or an eight or whatever. Like if I want a 10 power, I could just go buy a two to 10. I like the con, oh, I know where it is. It's on my scar uh, in there, but whatever. It's fine. I don't need to look at it. Best optic for LUM5. Again, all comes down to what you're getting the gun for. But I would recommend probably to 90% of people, just get a red dot. EOTech endpoint, even a hollow sun of some sort, uh, get a red dot, focus on that, get a scope if you actually have the need for magnification. But most people, a red dot is going to be much more intuitive, especially with less training, and you're actually going to be better off. Um, so, bull pups. Bull pups have their place. I'm not a huge fan. I prefer a conventional rifle like these with the magwells in front. It's a little bit easier to use, a little faster to use. Uh, obviously, it's not as balanced as a bull pup. I have an AUG. Uh, it's the only bullpup I actually own, uh, but I have access to Tavors and stuff like that. But I prefer conventional rifles more than bullpups. They're cool, though, because, like, you can shoot them one-handed really easily and dual-wheeled. But I still prefer... It can also run, like, high-powered stuff, which is great for armor penetration in a smaller package. Yes. So, like, I can see the advantage of a bullpup potentially being a bigger caliber than a standard 5.56 because it is, like, tiny, but I don't know. I'm still not a big fan of those. War Comp on 10.5. Yeah, they're, they're great. Um... This is a four prong on my 10.3, but I've run war comps on my short guns and they actually work really well. 458 SOCOM uh, sucks in Call of Duty. Um, you got to land every hit and you got to run sleight of hand. Uh, 458 SOCOM is like $4 a round or $3 a round. Uh, I don't play with any of those weird Gucci calibers. Mahler Ingall. I think Ingall. They're harder to get, but I like the Ingall more. Um, depending on the 416 upper. 416 upper, uh, they're not worth the money. They're like three grand right now on the gray market, whatever. Um, I really don't think they're worth it. I would say go get an MCX instead when those are in stock. You're paying 1800 for a full gun, 1900 uh, You got a piston gun. You could fold the stock. With a 416, it's sort of a piston hybrid direct impingement. It's still utilizing the buffer tube. Um, I'd say just get an MCX and skip the 416. The 416 is cool. It was definitely cooler like 15, 20 years ago. Uh, but now you have stuff like the MCX, and it's like, well, I get a 416 at this point. So, holy cow. Questions, questions, questions. Oh, my. I feel like Shroud right now or something. Olights, don't do it. Uh, I know they're really big on on YouTube because they pay people to say they're awesome. Don't do it. Uh, Echo trigger. Binary triggers are probably one of the worst, most worthless things you can put on your gun. Um, if you pull the trigger too fast or work the trigger too fast, you'll actually, like, unreset the gun and then you got to re-rack it and charge it that's what happened when i tried to run one um you're committed to two rounds every time you pull the trigger uh it's not like a three round burst where i can pull the trigger to the rear and all three go i have to pull and then let go it's just super finicky it's not great that's definitely a gimmick the only time i would consider using one is if i built like an 18 inch heavy barrel i used drum mags or something and i shot it from the prone and i just ran it kind of like a machine gun but again it wouldn't be that good i'd prefer having like a geisley trigger and shooting semi-auto would be way more effective the chat is cancer it happens it really does aero precision they're probably one of the best companies for the budget for the money uh, aero precision is really good uh, i've got a couple of their guns or i have one of their full guns and i've got a bunch of other parts from them like lowers and other stuff arrow is good to go I recommend them over Anderson or PSA. Uh, best zero for a 16-inch 300 blackout. Don't actually know what the best zero is. I do a 5200, and I hold... Uh, so I do a 5200, more or less, with my 300 blackouts with subs. Um, and then I hold... I was shooting seed zone at 100, and I was holding 6 inches high at 100. So then at 200, I'm aiming 6 times, like, 3. It's like 18 or more inches with subs. But I'm not going to shoot subs further than 100 so unity fast mount uh the fast mount can be really cool i'm sure i have one over here uh oh i do uh kind of 
Well, I don't have a thing on it. But the fast mount's super cool because it does allow you to stow a magnifier in the uh, below the optic itself, so that's really fun. Um, I don't have one mounted onto here. It is pretty tall. It's a 2.3 something. Um, but uh, I need to run this more. I was looking at this the other day, and I was like, hmm. This is a, and this is, I'm special because I have a gray one. Um, I was thinking about spray painting it. This is a prototype color that they were doing, um, just like really fast anodized or whatever, however that works. But um, they're pretty cool uh, for sure. They, they definitely cost some money. Like you're going to pay for it. So I per, honestly, I prefer a 193 Scalar Works mount. I, I, it gets the job done. It's great. Uh, we'll do a video of your 4Runner. Eh, maybe a vlog when we get those going to show you guys the car. The coolest modifications I have done to it is the blackout switches for IR lights. Um, I've got a piece that I actually molded to the vehicle myself. I can replace and Velcro into the dash. Um, my little heads up display area to dim that down sort of opaque uh, plastic, it's pretty cool. So I can drive nods, it's good fun. Parallel or converging zero? Uh, parallel zero all day with nods. So basically the idea with a parallel zero, I'll just run you guys through it. So my laser mounted at 12 o'clock, top side, does not have the laser perfectly in line with the bore, it's off to the side. So if I zero my laser to a point that converges with the round, so I'll demo with my, my fingers, so I have my rifle barrel like this. I'll hold it ah, there. Contrast. I'll hold it over here. Barrels like this. Laser, if I, it's mounted top side, is going to be on the right side. If I zero that laser to intersect at 50 meters with my barrel, that means the laser will keep going to the left, but the bullet keeps traveling straight. So now when I go to shoot at 200, I'm wildly off. So the idea with a parallel zero is I actually zero my laser perfectly on the right side of the gun because the laser is on the right side of the gun. So they're both like this. And obviously then the only issue you're gonna have, now side view is my, side view is my laser is going out like this and now my trajectory is actually going to fall off but my laser obviously continues because lasers, right? Sharks with laser beams. So uh, parallel zero in my opinion is more effective especially when you start shooting at distance. You only have to remember um, my laser's on the right, so I'm going to hold slightly right, but then the other thing that I do to actually get around that is if I'm up close, I literally just turn my gun, and that basically puts my laser and my bore. Now I only have to worry about elevation. I don't have to worry about one side, and I literally shoot the gun at an angle like this up close, and I'm set. So, but that's up close within like 15, 20 meters, something like that. Um, da -da -da -da, thoughts of the new Eatech 5 by I'd like to get one. I think I've been wanting a 5-power magnifier for a long time. The aim point one was... I, this is the Aimpoint 6 power, and uh, it's just super finicky. Eye relief is not great. The uh, field of view is not amazing. So my thought was, man, a 5 power that's a little wider, uh, you know, more like an ACOG would be pretty cool. So I've, been, I've had this for a while, and I haven't used it in forever. But So I prefer the, the I think the 5 by is going to be pretty cool. Don't have one. I actually texted a buddy of mine yesterday to find out when I could get one. And he was like, sorry, don't know. It's like, oh, great. He's a guy at EOTech. Um, do 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 trigicon reticles. Don't know a lot about trigicon scopes. I haven't run one in a very long time. Stop asking about 458 SOCOM. It's dumb. Unless you're, unle oh, unless, well, I guess it doesn't matter anymore. You're in Canada. Yeah. You can't have 30 round magazines, so you write on them 458 SOCOM because our standard PMAG will only hold 10 rounds of 458 SOCOM. It's pretty cool. It is pretty cool. Uh, you could probably do that in uh, California. Could you do that there? Or New York or one of those places where you're not allowed to have 30 round mags, you mark 458 SOCOM on it, and then yeah, you're like, no, eh. Perfectly. It's like, this is clearly only a 10 round mag. Big brain time. It is big brain. So that's where it's good, but uh, otherwise, no, don't do it. It's too expensive to shoot. And that's the thing. There's a lot of really cool calibers out there, right, guys? There's some legit stuff. The problem is it's kind of useless if you can't afford to actually go out and train with it. So that's what I tell people. They're like, because they see me running 300 blackout a lot. They're like, oh, I should get one. I'm like, no, don't get a 300 blackout until you have a 5.56 gun that you can train with because the training, it's more or less the recoil and everything's the same. But don't even bother with the 300 blackout until you have a 5.56 where the ammo is more prevalent, where you can actually train with it. It's only 27 cents a round, whereas 300 blackout's like 40 to 50 cents a round. Like the 300 blackout should not be your first gun. And honestly, the 300 blackout is really only super awesome if you can suppress it. So Get your 5.56 gun first, and then like your 13.7, your 14.5, your whatever. And then later, if you want to have the capability of having a smaller, baggable, quieter gun, then you can get that 300 blackout and you can cross train. Like the ratio I shoot 5.5 to 300 is like 
I don't know, it's like 10 for, a 9 for 1 probably of 5.5 five to 300. Well, right now I'm shooting a little more 300, but it's something like that. It's quite a bit of 5.56 five, for every round of 300 that I shoot. Because, you know, big brain with money, right? Uh, would I pack two laser hold up today if it's all you have? Yeah, I'd still run it. Uh, I've got one. I should actually run it sometime uh, on a gun. It's kind of fun to stick one of these on a, a newer gun just for like, just to troll people. So like, put this sucker on. Oh, you going to be cool? So this could actually be a lot of fun. So I, I take this guy, right? So we're good. Pop this. Will I be able to tilt it? Ah, who cares? I'll never disassemble this gun. So, what I could do. This is some real Battlefield 3 vibes right here, right? Uh, more or less good enough. Yeah! Okay, now we're talking. So then I'll just wrap my hand all the way up here like this to activate my PEC 2. And my EOTech, oh my goodness. Well, th that is in the way. Uh, I'll shoot through it. It'll be okay. Uh, it's not bad. It's not too bad. And then I have white light on this side of the gun right here. A little mod light punched out on this Russian sort of a extension mount with my PEC 2 right here. Come over the top. Yeah, that works pretty well. I could run that. The EOTech's kind of in the way though. So the answer is yes. You could run it. That's actually, that's actually pretty sick to be honest. Bad thing with the PEC 2 is it's only IR. Um, so you have to zero it under nods. That's why slave lasers are still way more effective because you can zero them basically at all times. MCX, love them. They're great. I've got four, I think, and I'm going to get more. In different varieties, maybe a Rattler at some point in 300. Uh, BRN 180. I think it's really cool that retro guns are like becoming a thing. Um, the reason I, there's a few reasons for that, but I think it is important that people like me and younger uh, respect you know, where we came from, you know, the early gen M4s, the early gen, you know, whatever it is. Uh, so that's something that I really like, but uh, I haven't gotten into some of those things yet. Like, I obviously like buying some older historical stuff, like that old Streamlight on that MP5 that dudes are running back in the 80s, or, you know, old Surefires, old aim points, you know, on my Irene gun. Uh, I love having that so I can have direct perspective and comparison to the technology that we have today. Um, now, would I go out and spend thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars on an old gun uh, just for a learning experience? Maybe, uh, possibly, um, but I haven't gotten into testing like that one or uh, Robinson is making a stoner um, style LMG type gun, a reproduction. That's pretty cool, um, but I don't know. I used to have an M16A4 that I wanted to play with, 20 inch, and uh, I got rid of it though. I never shot it. Are Elkans worth it? Uh, they have their place, although they weigh a lot and they definitely cost some coin. So, I don't know. I'd like to get one, though, for one of my scars at some point. I, I need to go do that at some point. Uh, ballistic Advantage versus Roscoe. Uh, honestly, I'm not a guy who does crazy ballistics testing. Um, so, don't know. But I'd probably choose the Ballistic Advantage over Roscoe, to be honest. If I had to pick, if I had to pick right now, you had two were in front of me, I had to grab one, I'd go Ballistic Advantage. Just because I know more people that have run those, I have more information on that, so I have a little more confidence due to brand, trust, and loyalty, and just understanding, I would go with the Ballistic Advantage if they were both presented in front of me right now, this second. It's not to say that Roscoe's are bad, I just don't know enough about their brand and their company. Zero distance. So, zeros. Another fun one. That all comes back to training, and here's why. You got your 100-yard zero. You got your 5,200. You got your 36. You got your 32. You got guys out there, they're like, I just invented the 47-yard zero. Like, I'm thinking I should make one. I'm going to call it the Luca zero. It's going to be uh, 20. No, it's going to be 49 and a half. So it'll be 49 and a half slash 180. That's my zero. Just kidding. I'm not going to do that because it's dumb. But the reality is all those zeros work. If you zero your gun properly, they will all allow you to do the thing that they are meant to do, and that is to put the send the bullet from point A to point B. But the main discussion comes in, how are you able to deliver that round in the first place? What is your skill level? What is the training that you have? Because at the end of the day, the zero matters, but the zero actually won't matter if you can't even hit the thing. It doesn't matter how refined and awesome your zero is. If you suck, you suck, and that's just how it is. I see a lot of people out there, they just... They're caught up with the wrong questions about like barrel length, zero, 
which optic and stuff like that. And some of those questions are good because sometimes the, ki the kit can make a difference. But at the end of the day, if you don't have the skills, none of this stuff makes a difference. Whether you've got an EOTech or an Aimpoint or a 12 and a half, a 10 and a half or a whatever, like no, it's not gonna matter if you don't have the skills in the first place. So as far as zero goes, frankly, I don't care what zero I have. All I care about is how good I am at moving and shooting. That's it, shooting when I get to a position, effectively and accurately, shooting on the move or at least moving to a position quickly and engaging from there. That's all I really care about. Now, most of my guns have a 5,200 meter zero. Uh, it is important to note though that 5,200 is not gonna be uh, perfect. It's gonna be dependent on your caliber and your barrel length, uh, twist rate, wind, humidity, barometers, all this cool stuff. Uh, not really, but so my 5,200 zero on, you know, a short gun may actually be a 50 slash 180. Uh, on a 16 inch gun shooting 77 grand, it may be 50 slash 210, something like that. If I zero exactly at 200, um, it may be a 4200 or a 54 by 200. Like it's not gonna be perfect. It gets you in the zone, it gets you in the area, but it is very much dependent on your barrel length and obviously the ammo that you're shooting. So don't think that exactly at 200 you're zeroed or exactly at 50 you're zeroed unless you chose one of those and actually zeroed at that distance with that gun, with that ammo. I've got ammo that's wildly different than other ammo. So, a couple more questions. Let's see. Uh, primary arms, prism scopes. Haven't used them much. Uh, prism scopes can be really good for people with astigmatisms um, because of just how the technology works. They have an etched reticle. They're not relying as much on the technology behind a uh, holographic or like a standard thing. R and VGs. Oh, I love it how people are asking night vision questions. Not really talking about night vision right now. I have buddies who have R and VGs. They like them, but... Uh, I personally want some DT and BSs once they come out. Uh, and I'm saying that as someone who has 31s, but I would like to have some DT and BSs. Uh, for pin and war comp, um, yeah. Well, here's the good news. If you pin a Surefire muzzle device, right, you at least can run Surefire cans. And the nice thing is, Surefire cans are actually pretty good. So you're not that much in a hole. Um, you're actually, you know, pretty well off. Like this 14.5, obviously it's pinned with a war comp, uh, but I'm pretty happy about that. I got Surefire cans. I can throw those suckers on there and I'll be good to go. And this one is timed to the right side. So when my hand is on the left side of the gun, it'll kind of like recoil this direction and it will push into my hand and I can like keep it, keep it, uh, keep it steady. So I like it, but you're not too screwed if you do a uh, Surefire muzzle device because Surefire suppressors are pretty good. What sucks is when you do a muzzle device for a company that goes out of business and then you can't get the suppressors. That would suck, but I don't see Surefire going away anytime soon, for example. Offset mount should be soon. We talked about that a little bit in the meeting today, uh, but I'm not going to give any numbers or dates or anything like that. Like I already leak way too much stuff. Let's be real. You, some of you guys are probably here from Instagram and... Uh, yeah, so you, you know what I'm talking about. I'm trying to get better. You know, I don't leak everything anymore. I leak that much of like this much. So I still, I like my leaks. It's good. Um, none of us play Tarkov, no. No, it's, I've already escaped. So why would I play again? I won't. CMC or Geisley? I'd say Geisley. Uh, I know it's a little hard to get Geisley products right now though, so that kind of sucks. I'm not sure about CMC's. A4 yard zero is the only one. But uh, tell, tell them to look into the LaRue triggers. LaRue uh, MBT, I think is what it's called. Uh, it's like an $80 trigger. I'd like to run one. I had one around here somewhere. Um, I need to put one in a gun. But uh, so, yeah. Um, shoot, I'm two minutes behind on these comments. Uh, sub ammo is hard to get. Yup. Uh, stay away from seven and a half inch barrels. You do lose a lot of ballistics. If it's 5.56, five, I'd say don't go below 10.3. Um, but otherwise it does still come back to training. If I had a seven and a half gun and it was close proximity, uh, would I still be able to use it? Absolutely. Uh, but obviously I'm not going to take that gun out very far. Um, the five, five, six loses a lot of its benefit of immense speed and temporary cavities and shock waves going into the body. Uh, once you drop below a 10, three barrel. So you don't want to do that if you, well, you know, we don't have to. Knight's armament. Yeah. Real fast. This probably be, actually, no, well, it'll probably handle a couple questions, but it's important to understand when you're looking at rifle companies, you've obviously got a couple different grades. You've got your like B grades, you've got your your A grades, maybe you got your C grades, those are like your weird fringe companies. But at the end of the day, once you get to grade A, which is like Knights, LMT, Daniel, uh, BCM, I would say they've had some quality control issues a few times here and there. I think that's just due to the amount of rifles they're selling now. Um, basically, the more product you make, if your failure rate is, let's say, 0.1%, uh, 
if I make 10,000 rifles, there will be more problems than if I only make 1,000. So some of the failures people are seeing from BCM, I don't think it's necessarily because the company is making massive mistakes. It's just because they're selling way more product. There's just more statistics, more numbers, and things like that. But and when they bring on more machines and they train more staff, there's... There's things that can happen during the whole process too. And I know they moved into a new building uh, last year, something like that. So big expansion. And we're going through some of that right now as well. Not with quality control. Although I'm sure some people would say that. Uh, so, change subject. Yeah, change subject. But we are having massive growth and expansion. And more on that later. We have some fun updates as far as that goes. But when you're in grade A rifles, you know, like those LMTs, Knights, all those guns, in my opinion, it doesn't matter. What really is going to matter is, and again, it doesn't really even matter that much, Warranty. Do those companies have good warranty in, in case you do get a lemon? And I would say most of them do. Um, but once you get to those grade A guns, it'll be like the, the benefit will be absolutely negligible between those brands. At that point, what you're buying is really what you're buying is what rail does it have and how much does it weigh? Like how modular is it with parts? Because at the end of the day, if you're already going to a grade A gun that's two grand or a little less, it's already a good gun, you know, and it doesn't matter. Like, I've got all manner of different guns, and people are like, why don't you get an LMT? And I'm like, because it would be just like all my other guns. Like, I don't need another super awesome AR. If I want a weird gun that's still kind of an AR, I'll get an MCX, or I'll get something different. Uh, so, like, why don't you have a Knight's Rifle? I'm like, well, an SR-16 or whatever is basically the same as my other guns that I already have. Like, it doesn't give me anything new or unique that I don't already have. And that's just the way it kind of works. You've got your grade Bs, which I would argue, this is my personal opinion though, you've got like your, your and well, Anderson, some people might say are grade C, but let's say grade Bs like error precision. You know, it's still a good gun. There may be a little more quality control issues going on. Maybe the rails aren't real great, you know, stock. Some of the parts aren't real good stock. You may change some stuff out. Um, and even those aren't bad, but as soon as you get to grade A, it really doesn't matter. Like you're there, just pick one, go with it, train, get bullets, shoot. Shoot, get good. That's just what it comes down to. Uh, ACR, no, 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 no ACR. Uh, oh, everyone's asking about, is this rifle A or a B? <laughs> um, yeah, we won't get into that too much. But you guys, get, you guys get my point. I hope you at least get my point. So anyway, 193. A lot of scope questions, ammo questions, good stuff, good stuff. Again, comes back to training. Doesn't matter what ammo. I mean, it does to some extent. But uh, it really matters on your training. Whether you're shooting like a ball round or a super fancy 5.56 five, round, if you can't even hit the target, hit the individual, your really fancy ammo isn't necessarily going to make a difference. So that's something that, that's a hard pill for some people to swallow. They think that all their fancy toys and ammos and like bullet, homing bullets that will like home to the threat will work. Uh, and the answer is, well, no, you still have to have skill uh, to make it happen and make it work. So. Uh, visible lasers, yeah, they're overrated. But I will say, visible lasers, having a laser unit such as this PEC-15, which has vis and IR, the benefit of this is I can zero this in the day. I don't have to wear night vision. I can set this over to vis mode, I can pop it, and I'm good to go. And you're not going to see it over there. Oh, you can. Oh, look, there it is. Da -da -da. I can zero it in the day. Uh, I can also use this to signal and be like, over there, there's things. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, vis lasers, very overrated on rifles. Uh, but they are good for zeroing your IR lasers, which are obviously, they need to be zeroed so that you can hit things. But again, it comes back to training. So with all that said, guys, we'll probably close it out. I know I didn't answer like a ton of questions. I tried to cover a lot of different things and really principles, you know, like we could talk specifics and we're going to do more videos on T-Rex arms soon, actually going over certain rifle builds, how we've set them up, different considerations, pressure pad locations, ergonomics, things like that. But at the end of the day, you got to have the principles before you can really get into this of, What's the purpose behind the gun that you're buying? Um, you know, and what scenarios are you seeing yourself using it in? And then do you actually have the training? Do you have the ability to actually put that weapon into use? Uh, or are you just a guy who collects fancy guns and sits back and is like, well, this fancy gun will save me because it costs like $5,000. And I'm like, no, you can't even do an up drill in two seconds. Like you can't even find your optic consistently. Like you're really not going to hit anything. You're basically like, you know, uh, third world individual is just going to poke a gun around a corner and do this. Like if that's your level of skill, it really doesn't matter if you have a $4,000 AR or a $600 AK. Like it's not going to matter. And obviously when we want to, we want to be better than that. We want to be more effective. We want to be accountable for our shots. That means we have to train. So you guys, you're probably, you've probably heard it a lot. Probably you're pretty used to it now. Me always saying training, 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 training. Um, gear has its place. It is important at times. I want to make sure I have quality equipment I can rely on. 
but I need to rely on my skill even more, and I think people need to focus on that quite a bit more than they do. So with that said, guys,